when I was looking at this topic, uh, what occurred to me was that uh, a lot of the concerns were ones that we'd actually raised in previous presentations. And so going back over the older presentations, uh, what I thought is I, I would do is to give uh, a combination of old slides uh, as well as new ones, just in terms of reminders, because what we're faced with, as, as you said earlier, we did predict some of these issues. So um, there've been a huge range of reactions if you've been following the, uh, the news uh, with respect uh, to access uh, to the vaccines as well as to the gaps in vaccine supply. But I actually wanted to start on a positive note and that is that we do have vaccines. I mean, if we think about the fact that we have vac three vaccines that have been made and are being used in less than one year, I mean, that's a phenomenal achievement. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. And I think we do need to celebrate that particular point. So these are the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, uh, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as I pointed out earlier, there are a large number of other vaccines that are still being tested and are in the clinical phase uh, of testing. However, vaccine studies do remain difficult. Uh, and the next slide, um, it was uh, a bit of a disappointment that Merck has actually abandoned two of its vaccines. Uh, I won't go into the details for, of this, but the reason they were abandoned was because they did not give us good uh, responses in their clinical studies as the three that are currently being used. So vaccine development does still seem to be, is rather a difficult process. And, and so let's keep that in mind as well. So next slide, uh, in addition to making the vaccines, uh, we touched a little bit about the bottlenecks on manufacturing. Um, and I went into this in a little bit of detail and unfortunately, what was predicted at that time does seem to be the case. Uh, making these vaccines is not, and scaling them up is not as trivial as one would uh, anticipate. And so a lot of the issues that are going on at the moment are with respect to the companies either not being able to meet the demands or meeting them in the appropriate time frame that they were expected. And the EU in particular um, has been posturing quite a lot about this in the last week. Now, anticipating the bottleneck, uh, the next slide, um, we, we talked about how to go about getting global and equitable access, uh, accepted the fact that there was not gonna be enough for everybody. Uh, and this gave rise to these initiatives that were looking at advanced market commitment and also how to get vaccines supplied, particularly to low and middle income countries. Uh, and WHO came up with uh, a, a mechanism for thinking about how to prioritize groups to vaccinate, which not surprisingly starts off with the frontline workers and then getting into the more adult population those at risk uh, and before getting up to the rest of the population. So next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, as we saw, this gave rise to vaccine nationalism, uh, people beginning to kind of queue jump, if you wanna call it for that, call it that, um, where lots of efforts were going on in terms of making bilateral deals with the production, uh, with the companies. Uh, but keep in mind that Gavi, which again was recognizing the fact that there needed to be, so this is the global the vaccine initiative, recognizing that there needs to be vaccines available for low to middle income countries, came up with a list of 92 countries that would benefit from these global initiatives. Um, and this next slide, this gave rise to what Jimmy has sometimes referred to, which is the COVAX facility. So the COVAX facility is, is led by Gavi, uh, WHO and, and CEPI. Uh, and as just said, the idea here was to try to guarantee a fair and equitable access for countries. So this was trying to secure 1.8 million doses for the 92 countries. Uh, and underneath that, it shows you what COVAX offers. Now, the problem or looking at equity, basically they're trying to aim for giving, covering at least 20% of the country's population. So not the entire population, but getting the vaccinations up and running, um, offering the number of different types of vaccines. And the problem is that the next 
column there is the caveat, vaccines to be delivered as soon as they're available. Um, and the idea was to actually treat the acute phase of the pandemic and then which would then help rebuild economies. Um, I hadn't actually seen any estimates of, of the global loss, but COVAX estimates that a vaccine would prevent the loss of about $375 billion per month to the global economy. And that's, that's a staggering sum that I hadn't actually appreciated. So next slide, let's look at what the AU has been doing. So that's the African Union. Uh, and this is information derived from this month. Um, so the AU has actually um, made orders for 270 million doses. Uh, this is from Pfizer and AstraZeneca. They actually list Johnson & Johnson there as well. But as far as I'm aware, Johnson & Johnson don't have a product on the market yet. Um, and the funding for this has come from various African sources here with an advanced commitment of $2 billion. Um, and so under COVAX, they will provide 600 million doses in Africa. And yes, the anticipation here was that first doses would become available in March. And if you've been following the news in Kenya, the next slide, please. Um, in Kenya, there have been recent um, uh, orders that have been made for 24 million doses. Um, this will cost the government uh, $43 million. Uh, and this uh, calculates at a cost of uh, just over $7 a dose. Now, this is twice the amount that was originally anticipated, if you remember back to my earlier presentations. Uh, and the Kenyan government has basically come up with um, an idea about how these would be used, obviously starting with the frontline workers and then going into those who are more susceptible. Now, the problem in all of this, of course, is that we don't know uh, whether the companies are going to be able to meet uh, these uh, dates in terms of production and delivery of these vaccines. So next slide, please. So continuing along the access to vaccines, so vaccines nationalism is giving way to vaccine diplomacy. Uh, and this just shows you an image here of Africa. Unfortunately, I've concentrated on Africa here, and I hope the Asian colleagues will, will forgive this. Uh, those countries that are listed in red will, will benefit from the COVAX uh, mechanism. But those that are not listed there, so countries like Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, South Africa, they've been make, they're, they're out of this. And so they've been making direct uh, contacts and linkages with the vaccine manufacturers to get vaccines directly. Um, and in fact, some of these countries have already started receiving vaccines and are being, and they are being used. Now, it's one thing to actually get the vaccines. Um, the next slide is what we're also seeing is that actually distributing the vaccines is not as easy as people, no, next, earlier, please. No, go back, please. Yeah, so the speed of vaccination. Um, and this is information showing how fast countries have been able to move in terms of getting their population vaccinated if they've had vaccines available. Um, and you can see that some of these smaller countries have been doing much better than the larger countries. And so having vaccine is one thing, being able to distribute it and get it out into your population is actually also proving to be a challenge. And so I hope that countries that don't have vaccines available yet are taking these types of things into account uh, and getting themselves ready for vaccinations once they become available. So next slide. So this was the big question that, that uh, Jimmy was asking was, when will global herd immunity be achieved? Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy in terms of what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated. Uh, I've seen uh, figures ranging from 40% up. Um, I think 70% seems to be the safer bet. Um, and next slide, please. So if, if we look at the, the countries where you're already beginning to have a larger, large enough percentage of the population vaccinated, uh, people are beginning to look at these countries in particular interest. And so, for example, in the Israeli situation, um, they have vaccinated just under 130,000 people and following up on those, those particular 
people, they, they only noticed 20 cases of COVID. And this 20 cases were, were mild symptoms. None of these were severe symptoms. So there's gonna be a lot of interest in following up on people as they get vaccinated. And we're gonna learn a lot more about the vaccines that are being used, how much herd immunity this will um, impart uh, and what percentage we need to get to before we start to become a little bit uh, less concerned, less concerned, I'm not saying not concerned, less concerned about the effect of, of the vaccine, uh, about the disease itself. So next please. So um, we're still in the early days of both pharmacovigilance as well as efficacy uh, assessment, because don't forget that the efficacy assessments come out mainly from phase three clinical trials. And we need to get efficacy data coming out now from the much larger population that's being vaccinated. So questions that we had posed earlier in earlier presentations, how long will the immunity last? Will vaccination prevent virus transmission? Is one vaccine better than the others? All of this type of information hopefully will start to come out soon. Uh, and are, actually are the vaccines still safe and, and safe in the different demographic uh, groupings? Uh, and what is the vaccine efficacy versus effectiveness? And there's a little bit of a difference between the two terms. Efficacy is derived from clinical data whereas effectiveness data is derived from when you go out into the general public and start vaccinating. And unfortunately, there is inevitably a drop in vaccine efficacy that is seen when you start to look at effectiveness, because this is basically done under non-control situations, whereas clinical trials are very controlled. Okay, so um, the question of vaccine efficacy and effectiveness kind of leads me to the second part of the presentation which is the effect of the SARS-CoV-2 variants that we've been seeing um, and the implications uh, of their spread um, and whether they're going to be breaking through the current vaccines. So before I go into the data, I think it's useful just to look at a bit of the nomenclature here because this can be a bit confusing. Um, and mutations in the SARS-CoV-2 genome refer to actual changes that take place in the genome sequence itself. Uh, and viruses whose genetic sequences differ are called variants. And that's the term that we've been hearing more uh, in the public domain. Now variants can contain a few mutations and those that contain few mutations belong to the same lineage. And variants can either have the same characteristics or they can have different characteristics. And those which have different characteristics are actually called strains. And so from a vaccine perspective, what we're really more interested in identifying are those variants which have different characteristics, which then might allow them to escape the current vaccines that are being used, okay? Uh, and next thing is that the lineages are important to follow because this allows epi epidemiological study to take place to, to define how viruses spread through communities. Uh, and these are normally relieved through, uh, revealed rather uh, through next generation sequencing efforts. So next slide. So we have a number of variants that are floating around uh, and they're not unexpected. Uh, viruses do change, viruses do mutate. However, some of them are of concern. And so the notable mutations that the scientific community have been concerned with are those that alter the function of the spike protein. And you remember now, this is the spike protein that's being used in the vaccine. And it's also the protein that's responsible for initiating infection. Um, and there are three mutations that I've listed there, uh, D614 to G, E8, uh, E484 to K and N501 to Y. And what that reflects is just the position of where that mutation occurs in the molecule and the change of the amino acid sequence that's taken place from the vaccine strain. So for example, N501Y is an asparagine amino acid residue has been changed to a tyrosine one. So if we look at the variants that have been reported in the UK, uh, there's this one called B117. In South Africa, it's there's a mutant called, a variant called B1351. There's a new one in Brazil, B1. 
Uh, and there's actually also one in Kenya that's been identified called the Taita variant, uh, which is DATA. Now, if we look at these mutations, these mutations actually map in a part of the spike protein which interacts with, which is important for infection, let's put it that way. And so that's why the D614G, E, the 484 and 501 mutants are of particular concern uh, because, uh, next slide, um, in vitro, they've been shown to reduce the, in, uh, they've been shown to be less efficacious uh, or rather overcome uh, the, uh, the ability for antibodies in particular to be able to neutralize those viruses. Notwithstanding that, however, I think it's still too soon to say that the current vaccines that we have will not work. And there's been an interesting study uh, just published uh, last week uh, from a group in Seattle uh, that's looked at the effect of the mutations uh, and the implication of them not so much for vaccines per se, but they have a more profound effect on the use of monoclonal antibody therapeutics. And you remember that was the last topic that I covered. And monoclonal antibody therapeutics basically replacing vaccines as a way of passively uh, getting passive protection. Now, because monoclonals are designed for a very specific part of the molecule, uh, unfortunately, what the study has shown is that the Regeneron cocktail of monoclonal antibodies may be quite susceptible to the mutants that are floating around. So it's too soon to say whether the vaccine will, will fail. I don't think they're going to fail, but they may not work at the same efficacy. Uh, next. And the reason for that is because the in vitro, next slide please. The in vitro situation is really very different from the in vivo situation. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Hello? Jimmy, can you, still, can you still hear me? Okay, I'm, yes. I'm, not, I'm not seeing the next slide. Is that, is that stuck? No, it is up on the screen. Okay. I don't see it on my screen, so I'm going to have to... Uh, um... Slide 25. Ah, okay, there it goes. Yeah, all right, sorry. Okay. So what I was saying is that the in vitro assays that are being used are extremely... Uh, they're, they're very different from the in vivo situation. Uh, because in the in vivo situation, following the vaccines, if you remember what I said is that you get a large number of antibody responses. You also get a T-cell response. Um, and so it's too soon to say that the current vaccines will not work. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I was alluding to this earlier that this, the, the, the data that I'm showing you here is actually out of date as of this morning. Because if you saw the BBC uh, news this morning, there is uh, a vaccine coming out from the Novavax company, which is based on a protein uh, vaccine. Uh, and the data coming out from there is, to, is, is showing that the vaccine works against both the, U, the UK variant uh, and it works against the South African variant as well. Um, now, in the absence of those vaccines, they haven't come online yet, but that's really good information because what it means is that um, we have next generation vaccines that are coming out from the current work that's going on. But don't forget that part of why the three vaccines that we have currently in, in work as they were rapid response technologies. And so these companies have actually already started working on the variants and looking at how to put the variants into the next generation vaccines as well. So I think in the longer term, um, we're gonna have vaccines available that will cover all the variants that will come out. The current vaccines will work against the others. Whether they will work as well or not remains to be seen. Um, so really, that's what I wanted to cover, Jimmy. I hope that gives you uh, an indication of where we are and everybody else. And so as I finished off last time as well, and the next slide is unfortunately for the coming period, we still don't have any choice but to keep security 
on on the top of our minds. Just just one more thing, Jimmy, re re relating to the time frames that you were talking about. I, I saw a, a recent um, um, publication from the Economist, where the intelligence unit of the Economist was actually trying to assess the global access to the vaccines, the current vaccines, that is. And what they were saying was that the advanced communities or the bulk of the population in the advanced communities will probably be vaccinated by mid-22. The timeline would extend to early 23 for the middle-income economies and stretch out to 2024 for the poor economies. And that's assuming that there weren't going to be any other delays in the supply chain. So the supply chain still seems to be the major issue. I think the science side of things can be controlled. Thanks. Thank you, Vish. That was really helpful. Um, to analyze, um, learn <laughs> what are variants, what's the, when we talk about mutations and variants and strain, what those all mean. Uh, what is the current state of the vaccine uh, value chain, if you like, global supply versus global demand, and so on. I have one question before you go, Vish. I mean, I think your bottom line, including the last report on The Economist you mentioned, is that developing countries low and middle income countries are a long way from getting this vaccine given current production capabilities and so on. But what if, Vish, we do have a variant? Um, well, not, not the variant so much, but suppose we find out that the protection of the vaccine is only a year. Wouldn't the developing country, the developed countries who are trying to get to her, herd immunity, if it's only a year of protection, they will start all over revaccinating, so buy up all the supply again. Could is that what are your thoughts, maybe you and Data, about the issue of protection? Is this long-term protection? So indeed, once the developed countries finish vaccinating, the rest of us will get? Or are they going to want it soon again because it's only a limited period of time? And so developing countries may never get it. Uh, that's a great Actually, question. Yeah, it's a great question, Jimmy. I mean, I, I don't know how that's going to play out. But my, my thinking is that if we look at what happens with the flu vaccine, where there is a new flu vaccine that's made on an annual basis, um, and there is a mechanism in place uh, that's, that's been put into place by WHO where they um, assess the, mutant, the, the, the flu variants that are floating around the globe and try to predict which are the variants that are likely to be present in five to seven months time. And so the flu vaccines are actually made way in advance of the next flu season, five to seven months in advance. Uh, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the way, if coronavirus indeed goes along that line, which is still questionable. Um, because it really, it, at the moment at least, it, it certainly doesn't evolve at the same rate as the flu, as the flu virus does. Uh, but I think you could envisage mechanisms coming in place where it would be possible to be able to uh, control future variants, provided you can get the manufacturing side and supply side of it um, in tandem with the ability to be able to come out with the new variants. Do we know about... Um... I read a lot about countries talking about vaccine production as a security <laughs> need. Are there many plants being built around the world? Do you know? Are yes. people investing in supply? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there are lots of new ones going up in place. Uh, lots of people are retooling. Um, the Serum Institute of India has done a phenomenal job 
um, they're actually going to be involved in the Novavax vaccine that I just talked about, this new one that's coming online. They're already behind AstraZeneca. They're behind the other two vaccines that are being made in India. And lots of other countries are again doing the same. Um, they're actually building new facilities and they're adapting old ones to be able to redesign and re-get into making the new vaccines. Now, what, what really gives me extra hope is that the Novavax vaccine is, is based on true and tested technologies uh, that the vaccine companies are more familiar with making. And actually, I think that there are even better technologies that are in line, which will come about in the next six to eight months, which will be even easier to manufacture, I think, uh, than the Covavax, vac uh, the Covavax vaccine. So I think over this, this current year, we'll see a huge change in what will be available and what could be uh, designed for future outbreaks as well. Yeah. You know, just uh, two, two comments what uh, we said before. You know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they have very good data. So it's a vector vaccine and most likely will be getting uh, emergency market authorization in May in Europe. And uh, this is more one of the classical vaccines. And I think that's uh, um, an important step forward. The other thing, you know, new production side, everybody is working on that. You know, Sanofi uh, is the largest vaccine company, except the one in India. Um, and they didn't develop their own uh, COVID vaccine, but they have from former time, the bearing manufacturing site close to Frankfurt in Germany. And they're starting in May producing there the BioNTech vaccine. And they say they will produce uh, 250 million doses until the end of the year. So there is a lot of improvement coming up. Uh, but otherwise, you know, in Europe, in example, with the exception of countries like UK and uh, Israel, where the, the rollout of vaccination is very, very slow because, you know, they order um, the promises uh, of vaccine doses getting is uh, not there. Interesting is also, you know, in, that in, in Europe, at least, you know, Many people are still skeptic uh, with uh, getting a sh vaccine shot. Germany is good. 67% of the German population wants to be vaccinated. The, the worst country is France in Europe. Only 35% of people are ready to get a vaccination. So that's an important information too when we talk about herd immunity. If the people don't, don't come for vaccination, you are far away from um, from uh, herd immunity. The other thing is, uh, Jimmy sent me yesterday an article from the CBC in Canada, and there was a nurse. She had both shots, the BioNTech shot, and, uh, uh, and after both shots, she got uh, positive two weeks after the second shot, she became positive for coronavirus again. And the question is, you know, how can this happen? Um, but we know that immune people could still carry and transmit COVID-19. So this is something which is important to know. Again, an, an, a clear statement that we will have our non-pharmaceutical interventions like uh, mask hand washing uh, will be important for the future. In addition, it could be, you know, the BioNTech vaccine say they have a 95% vaccine uh, uh, efficacy. So maybe uh, this nurse is one of the 5%, which is there, or maybe, but we hope not. This is a strain, uh, a new variant, which is not covered by the vaccine. But the good news is yesterday, the EMA, the European Medicine Agency agreed that the data shown by biotech, uh, at least for the UK variant, that the UK variant is fully covered. So let me talk about the boring thing about Musk. And there's two occasions which really started the discussion again. And the one is more a global discussion. Everybody followed the inauguration of Joe Biden. 
And, you know, there was this young poet, Amanda Gorman, which uh, fascinated everybody, but also fascinated people because she was wearing two masks. And the other thing is, you know, in, um, in Europe, particular Germany, Austria, they started to um, say only FFP2 masks are allowed. And you see here our German Minister of Health, and I will tell you why this is important. Next slide, please. So still most people use the closed mask. And, you know, there is now a tendency to go away from closed masks, but still they have the importance, particularly in countries uh, where you can't buy FFP2 masks uh, as many as you want. And, you know, the CDC, the uh, US uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, made a, a study again, and uh, the conclusion from November last year is that experimental and epidemiolo epidemiological data show clearly that community masks uh, can reduce the spread of SARS-CoV virus 2. Uh, and the prevention benefit of masking is derived from the combination of source control, that means everything what you exhale, and personal protection, so inhaling for new mask wearer, for the mask wearer. The relationship between source control and personal protection is likely complementary and possibly synergistic. Individual benefit increase with increased community mask use. So as more people have a mask, as better it is for each individual in this community. Therefore, don't, don't be shy and just remind people if they are around you that they should wear the mask. And, uh, and this, the last sentence, I think is a little bit too positive that adopting universal, universal masking policies can help avert future uh, lockdowns or anything. Uh, I think that will be not happen. Next slide. So here, the, the face mask function, uh, just to say the closed face masks, so the simple ones, they have some source control. So they can help that um, droplets in the exhaling are kept in the mask, but they are very bad in inhaling filtration in the air. Surgical masks, you know, these are the, the, the light blue ones. They are very good in source control but still bad in if they function against or function for your protection. Then the respirator, these are this FFP mask or uh, FN, so they have different names. I come back to this. They're very good for source control, but also good for your personal protection. And that's, I think, something we have in the past not so much looked at, but I think for your personal protection is very good if you can um, get this type of mask. And then the respirators with an exhaust valve, they are good for source control, but they're very bad for others because through the valve, you, you uh, exhale all your droplets into the community around you. They are only used you know, in, in high infectious uh, areas um, where you need to definitely protect uh, people working in this area. Next slide. So, you know, this is the, the famous surgical mask or medical mask as it's called. And if we talk about protecting yourself against coronavirus, um, and it, it has, as I said before, it has not proven that this face mask can effectively protect you against viral infections. And you have to look at the side of this mask, there is not, not a good fit between the mask and the face. And this opening is a problem uh, as well for inhaling as for exhaling. Um, they are probably able to catch some germs before they reach your mouth or nose. And more importantly, they prevent people from touching their mouth or nose, and which most people do instinct, instinctually, me, my, myself as well. And if you are already sick, such much can help uh, to reduce the infection to others. So this is this mask, which are good for um, protecting the others, the environment, but not as good protecting yourself. The next slide. 
one is wearing so a see, mask, then it's okay. So this is now the double mask. Um, double masking makes, and um, you know, Dr. Fauci, the famous science advisor to the U.S. government, say double masking makes common sense and is likely more effective. And this goes back to the inauguration where everybody started to talk about it, not about the gloves of Sunday's only. So this one away. So double masking. Uh, for sure, it's logic that a virus should have a tougher time getting through two layers than just one layer. Wearing close mask tightly on top of a surgical mask could provide even more protection. And I think that's a very good strategy to have these two uh, masks. And so there's then no, no gap between your face and the mask. And Fauci said, uh, you know, this is a common sense thing. And now the question is coming, uh, how about three layers? Yes, three layers most likely are better than two layers. If three is better than two, how about four? And you could say, what about 200? But finally you can't press because the, it's so tight that you can't press at this. But also if you see it, the, the, the right thing, if you don't have a medical mask, uh, this double masking is a good thing. And the white thing, one of the best one are the, is the, the uh, taking a filter which is made from your vacuum cleaner package. So they are very good in, in, in keeping these droplets uh, away. So that's a good thing. Next slide. So now this was the two, two mask, and now the um, ways up Mandarin FFP2 mask. Uh, in shops and transport open buildings, you have now to have FFP2 mask. And FF, FFP actually means filtering face piece. And FFP2 is the name mainly in Europe. You know, in other regions, they are called even KN95 or N95 or P2. So, and the fantastic thing with this one is, uh, that the FFP2 respirator is a tight fitting mask which creates a facial seal and filters both inflow and outflow of air. And they remove about 94% of all the particles in, in a certain size. But this is the size, you know, where you have the aerosols. And uh, uh, so it's a much better protection for yourself. It's not only a protection as the as the clothes mask for the people being around you. So it protects yourself as well. But if you say here, tight fit over nose and mouth, but if you look at the, the uh, imaging there, people with, beard, with a beard are, are terrible. They should be not around you because there is no seal between the mask and the skin. There's a lot of uh, gaps where the uh, where the aerosols can get out and inside as well. So for beard people, there was a discussion here in Europe that official people working in medical facilities are not allowed to have a beard. Uh, the other imaging here shows because, you know, uh, FFP2 respirator costs about, in Europe, about uh, between two and five dollars. So there's a lot of poor people in, um, in, in, even in European countries, and there will be more poor people because of the lockdowns in future. So the government said, uh, we need to make it, uh, we make this uh, mask accessible for poor people as well. And you see, even I got a voucher from the government that I can go to a pharmacy and I get then uh, six uh, FFP2 masks uh, free of charge. Next slide. Because the price of this uh, FFP2 mask is high, everybody is now saying uh, many people can't go there and buy for every day new masks for the whole family. It will be a, uh, quite an, an investment. So as you see the, the left image, it shows the, if you want to reuse your FFP2 mask, it takes about seven days. So the red spots are still the, the, the virus or the droplets, and it takes about seven days that they go to zero. So one strategy could be, you know, that the, uh, each, in the, each person in the family has a mask for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and so on. 
and takes on Monday, the Monday mask, put it back there. Next day, it takes the Tuesday mask. So you can then take this mask a couple of times without um, washing or without uh, uh, treating, especially because then there could be a, um, a problem there. Or as you see done, there is, uh, you need, uh, have to put it in the oven for by a temperature of 80%. And then they are disinfected again and can use them again, but this process uh, destroys the mask uh, quicker than the other uh, side. Next slide. So these are FFP3 masks, which is only used, uh, you know, in in uh, COVID uh, uh, stations. But I just wanted to show you and see more and more often you see this type of mask available and they have a valve and the valve is a problem for people around you because uh, there's a fantastic uh, protection if you inhale but there's no protection for the people around you by exhaling so it it is not anything which should be used in the community and uh, therefore i think it's very clearly if we said before about the cases you know being people vaccinated and becoming positive again, I think uh, the mask will be go on. And the rules here in Europe are even if you are vaccinated, you are forced to have a mask because nobody knows when you are uh, become a carrier again. You can be vaccinated, but can be a carrier, and then it needs to protect others by having a mask. And I think that's a good solution. My last slide, please. So I, I like this statement, Sir Peter Midaver, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1960. And he said, you know, no virus is known to do good. It has been well said that the virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. And I like this statement very much. And it will make clear that we live with mask uh, the next years uh, absolutely as well as we do now. And uh, we have, we have to continue with all these activities. Thank you very much.